ZBrush is the most powerful sculpting software out there. Since it's not included in your maximum subscription, it's actually one of the best times to start learning ZBrush. However, getting started can be a little daunting as the UI has a lot of options and it's a little bit different than most other 3D software. In this tutorial, I'm going to guide you through your first day in ZBrush. Hey everybody, my name is Anna Carolina Pereira, and I am a 3D technical and character artist, a VR and game developer, ZBrush live streamer, and professor at the Ringling College of Art and Design. Today I've teamed up with the School of Motion to introduce you to ZBrush 2022. In this tutorial, I'm going to walk you through the UI and navigation, as well as my favorite five tools to get you started in your sculpting journey. And of course, during the process, I'll be giving you some awesome sculpting tips. If you want to follow along, feel free to download the working files that I have provided for you in the description below. If you've just opened ZBrush for the first time, you might see the window looking like this. It can be a little overwhelming for a lot of first time users. So I'm only going to show you in this tutorial everything you need to know. As you go, feel free to add more and more tools and workflows to your process. First, we have this big kind of attention grabbing window called the light box. In the light box, you have a bunch of little tabs where you can see different tools, brushes, you can add to your preset projects that ZBrush has provided for you and things like that. To turn off the light box so that we can look at the UI properly, we can click this big light box button right here at the top left or comma key on your keyboard. Next, we are greeted with the canvas or document. Those names can be used interchangeably right here. This is where the actual sculpting will be seen. At the top, we have our palettes. You might be used to a lot of softwares having file edit and things like that at the top. We still have that, although ZBrush is in alphabetical order, so file and edit are right here. And we have a ton of little palettes here. As we go through, you'll find that all of these palettes contain all of the options within ZBrush and all of these options right here already seen on screen are just extracted from these palettes. For example, the tool palette right here can also be seen up here. When you select one, the other one goes away. Isn't it interesting? We can use these triangle um, buttons here to kind of open tabs at the side, bottom and top to tab our own palettes. Starting with the top, we have a bunch of brush options, for example, the intensity of the brushes and modes, draw, edit, and move, things like that. We will talk about those later. On the left, we have some brush material and color options. And on the right, we have some transpose options and like how to move around and whether or not we want to show multiple subtools or just one, things like that. That is the overview of our ZBrush project. If you want to get started and you just start dragging stuff in here, you'll notice all these little squares. Okay, that's because we are in draw mode and we're literally just adding copies of little models or primitives in here all willy nilly. It's a very common issue for starters to add too many copies of the same thing into the canvas. So the way to clear that is control N for new. That will clear the canvas out for you. The next thing you might notice is that the canvas is pretty small compared to the rest of my screen, right? Why not use all of this real estate? Well, we can go to Documents, New Documents. We don't really need to see the documents. And now it automatically expands to the size of our available screen. So now you can draw your squares all over the place. I'm going to open the double triangles on the right side because by default, the tool palette is already docked in here. Initializing new projects into ZBrush is a little bit different than most other 3D software. So you actually need to know a couple of steps in order to get started. I'm going to click this big, the biggest button we have here, which right now says simple brush, but if I click on it, if I hover it, I mean, it says tool. A tool in ZBrush is just another way to say a 3D model, or maybe a collection of 3D models. Once we click that, we can see here some primitives for us and a bunch of other stuff that we will not be looking at today. But let's go ahead and select a sphere. You might expect the sphere to show up on the document on its own, but that is not quite the case with ZBrush. 
What you need to do now is click and drag one time so that the sphere can be placed in the world. It will automatically be in the center of the world no matter where you click and drag. As you can see though, you do have the potential to click and drag and add as many spheres as you'd like. Try avoiding this. Sometimes you'll even click one time and not even notice, but then you do like a micro sphere or a micro model. Press Ctrl N to clear the canvas, do it one time, and then go to edit mode. Edit mode can be found up here with the other modes, and the shortcut for that is T. If I click that, I can now drag without adding new spheres because I'm no longer drawing, and I can kind of see that my one sphere is starting to become more interactable. You must be in edit mode to, well, edit your model. So if I try sculpting on this at all, you're going to get a warning. This isn't always the case, only really with primitives, and in this case, a sphere is a primitive. To enable sculpting, please convert this 3D primitive to a Polymesh 3D by pressing the Make Polymesh 3D button in the tool palette. Well, that gives us a very clear indication of what needs to be done next. I recommend as you go, and you probably know this, to always read warnings and never hit OK or Cancel without reading first. So I'm going to click off and go to the tool palette where it was indicated to me and find this big button called Make Polymesh 3D. Click that one time you'll notice that it seems like some of the options have changed. That is because our mesh is now editable. And you can, for example, already come in here and start editing your mesh with the standard brush, which is the brush that is currently selected by default. Next, and very importantly, we need to discuss navigation. Navigation is the process of being able to rotate around your model, move it up and down, side to side, zoom in and out. Today, I'll be showing you two methods of navigation. The first is kind of the default method that ZBrush has provided us historically. And the second one is probably the easiest one. So you can pick between both. However, I believe there are four or five different ways to navigate. So feel free to look at the documentation and find your favorites. There's something out there for everyone. The first way you're going to rotate is to click and drag on the canvas. The direction you drag on the canvas is going to change the direction that you're rotating in. So I always recommend to my students, just do this a bunch of times, kind of like Karate Kid style, or just do it a bunch of times, get used to it. So we're going to start by rotating. You can snap the rotation. As you're rotating, if you press Shift, it will snap to the next closest perfect rotation angle. Okay, so rotate, shift, rotate, shift, like that. You'll notice that the little head up here also changes as we rotate. That's because it's indicating to us which way the front is. So now I know that the front of my model is right here. You can also grab that little head and rotate. Okay, and that is yet another way to do that. Next, we have translating or moving. OK, what we do is it's a similar process to rotation, but you're going to press down and hold Alt on your keyboard, and then you're going to drag on the on the backdrop like that, up and down. Last, we have zooming. The default zooming is a couple of steps. First, you're going to hold down Alt. Then you're going to press down the canvas, let go of Alt, and drag. OK, so the Alt is very transitory in this case. You just use it until you click, then you let go and you do it. If you take too long though, you might lose the ability to zoom. So just try a bunch of times making it pretty fast like this. If you ever zoom in too close and you can no longer drag on the, on the canvas, you might be confused. Do not worry. Do you see this white line, this little white border? You can still use the area outside of this white border as if it was the canvas like a little handle. You can also press F on your keyboard to frame the mesh perfectly into the frame. Next, let's talk about the easy way. <laughs> so you'll notice here on the very skinny right panel that we have move, zoom, and rotate. If you click and drag these buttons, they will do exactly what they say. And a lot of students find this easier for their first day in ZBrush than learning the more complex methods of, of zooming. Although I do find that these give you a little bit less control, so I do prefer the default method. 
I'm going to get rid of these original edits I've done on the sphere so that I have a nice cleaner place to start showing you some brushes. I can simply press Ctrl Z to undo all of those changes or do you see this very thin bar up here? This is the undo history bar and this is one of the really cool things about ZBrush that you can just click and drag on this history bar and it will remember everything you've been doing and you can basically do some time traveling here. So try it out. I'm just going to move my bar all the way back to the beginning and I have a clean new sphere. There are four brushes I want to show you today. And I believe that with these four brushes, even though we have a gigantic amount of brushes to pick from, and this is just the defaults, with these four brushes, we can get just about any sculpt done. So the first brush is the move brush. To change brushes, we have a couple of options. We can go here to the brush button, this big old brush button right here, like that, and it will open up the brush palette for you. Next, you can simply find the move brush right there, or you can make your life a little easier by pressing down the first letter of the brush's name. Little by little, you'll come to know a lot of these brushes by name, but first let's just press down M for move, and there it is. As you'll notice, there is an extra little letter by the side of every one of these brushes. That is the letter that completes the shortcut for that brush. So the move brush, press, first you press M to uh, highlight it and then V, select it, or you can just press on it, really. The other way to do this is to press B on your keyboard, which automatically opens up the same brush palettes, M and V, and that selects the move brush. Try it out on your sphere. You'll notice that the move brush grabs the vertices within that little circle of influence and it pushes or pulls depending on how you drag your mouse. It always tries to create kind of a straight line towards your, your cursor and the more you pull, the more dramatic it becomes. Try it out a few times, there we have it. <laughs> we can also change a lot of the settings within our brushes. So let's talk about draw size. Right up here, we have some simple brush settings. Draw size, focal shift, which is basically the hardness and softness of the brush, the intensity, things like that. If I make their size bigger, I can influence more of the sphere. I love using this to create like, you know, big changes in the form, as you'll see later. If I make it tiny, I'll make little spikes. Another way to reach all of these settings here is to press and hold spacebar on your keyboard. I personally prefer this way because then I don't have to move my hand to go grab stuff up here. It just shows up wherever I'm already hovering. See how awesome? And then you can just change the jaw size in here. Pow, 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 pow. The next brush I want to talk about is the clay. The clay, you can find it by pressing B to get your brush palette, C to isolate all the brushes with C, and L will be the, the letter that completes the shortcut. Try using it and you notice that it's just adding a little, like almost as if it was real clay, adding a little bit of volume to the mesh like this. That is its default setting. But I want you to know something really cool about ZBrush. And that is that if you press down Alt and then you use your brush, it inverts the brush's mode. So if the brush is not naturally additive, pressing Alt will subtract. And if the brush is naturally subtractive, it will add. It is very interesting and you can use the same brush for multiple effects. Try it out on your own. Then, I'm going to undo this. Then we can talk about Z intensity, which is the amount with which the brush affects the surface. This brush has a 50, per, uh, a 50 intensity default, which looks like this. But if I turn it to 100, it becomes a little bit more intense. It's not super dramatic, but you'll see when I turn it to perhaps eight, how the intensity is much lower. This way you can get different levels of intensity with the same brush as well. Let's turn it back up. The focal shift is also a setting to play with. It is basically, if you use Photoshop before, you know this, what I'm talking about, but basically it changes the hardness or softness, basically the fall off of the brush. The higher you make the focal shift, can you see my mouse changing? Let me make my draw size bigger so you can see it. The, lo the littler I make it, the more pointy my brush will be. And the bigger I make it, the more hard my brush will be. Basically, the inner circle represents where the brush will be applied with 100% intensity. The outer circle is 0% intensity. And the area in between them is a linear fall off. So the more fall off, the softer it is. 
So if I make the brush super pointy like this, high focal shift, and then I click and drag, you see that the brushes become pointier and softer. If I make it negative 100, you see it becomes very hard with like a very hard edge. This is going to be extremely useful, especially as we get into alphas. Next brush I want to introduce you to is the Damien Standard or Dam Standard brush. D for Dam Standard. There it is. The next letter is S for that. So DS is the shortcut. And this one acts like a little knife, which is extremely useful. If you've ever done clay sculpting, you know that you need a little bit of a knife to kind of cut things, create creases, wrinkles, things like that. If you use this brush and you press Alt, you'll notice that it inverts. And with Alt, it actually comes out, which is the exact inverse of the default, which is to go in. Extremely, extremely powerful brush. Next, we have the paint brush. B to get the brush palette. P for paint. There it is. A is the next letter. And this one will allow you to paint and change the basically the, the poly paint of your, of your mesh, which is basically vertex painting to some degree. But the thing is, is that right now I could paint, but I have a red sphere and it's going to kind of distract from the paint. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the material of the sphere before I change the paint. So right here where it says matte cap red wax, if you hover, it says material. I'm going to click that. And you can find all of these other materials that will automatically fill your sphere. The one I like to use and that I recommend for you today is the basic material. Second option on the bottom tab right there. Okay, and this will give us a very nice option for painting. You might come in here and select a color to start painting with, but oh my goodness, it is now filled with that color. Don't worry, this is just a preview color and it changes as you change the color, okay? So what you're gonna do is you're going to, and this is part of the prep for the rest of the tutorial as well, so make sure you do that. We're gonna select white, go to color up here in the, in the palettes and fill object, and now, as if it was the paint bucket tool in Photoshop, it's filled my entire sphere with the color white. When I select that red to fill it out with, you'll notice that it no longer changes because it is permanently white. Come in here with my paintbrush and I can paint and look at that. I got some beautiful color. That, okay. So with these four brushes, we can achieve so much today. So I can't wait to walk you through the rest of the tutorial. Before we actually get started with our sculpt, we also need to talk about some of the operations that you can do while sculpting. I'm going to switch back to my Damien Standard brush, B to get the palette, DS. There it is. And I'm going to talk a little bit about masking, selection, and a few other things, okay? So the first thing we're going to do is mask. All a mask is in ZBrush, as well as in basically any other program, is basically selecting an area to make it frozen or uneditable. The way you do that in ZBrush is you press down and hold control. Your, your cursor will become yellow and you can drag on your sphere. And you might think to yourself, I'm just painting my sphere a dark color. No, that is a very temporary dark color. That is the mask. Try sculpting on it. You cannot but you can sculpt right outside of it. Isn't that wonderful? So now you can use this masking to protect areas you don't want to edit. You can even create interesting shapes. So for example, if I do a heart and I sculpt all around it, you'll notice that I get a perfect heart shape when I undo my mask. Okay, so it's very powerful to Invert the mask, you just control click one time outside on the canvas, and now the inside of the heart is the editable area and the outside is frozen. To clear a mask, you just control drag outside on the canvas. Next, we have selection. To select, you just control shift uh, and hold on your keyboard, and you'll notice that your cursor turns white. You can drag out and select an area that you'd like to see and it will hide everything else that isn't that area. The area that's not see visible is not going to be editable either, but this one is very good for isolating a single area. Let's say if your poly count's too high and your computer's a little slow, or if two areas are kind of touching and you don't want to see the other, you want to get a clearer view, there you have it. 
to clear the selection, you just control shift click one time outside on the canvas. And to invert the selection, you just control shift click one time on the model. Okay. You can also smooth as you sculpt. So let me make a couple of ridges here that need a little smoothing. To smooth, you're just going to press down shift on your keyboard and then drag on the model. And that will smooth out your model. By the way, I highly recommend using a drawing tablet if you have one with pressure sensitivity when using ZBrush, because that way, as you press down lighter, you smooth less. And if you press down harder, you smooth more. And this is applicable to all pressure sensitivity based brushes. Before we move on, make sure to subscribe and hit the like button if this tutorial is being helpful. So let's begin the process to design our little alien. And I say design because I did not pre-plan how this is going to look, so we're going to find out together. <laughs> I'm going to start by grabbing my history bar, starting over. Oh, I'm, I'll maybe leave the whites on. Make sure you leave that on. And then I'm going to start sculpting. No, I'm not actually. I am going to turn on symmetry. Symmetry is a very powerful tool and it works very well in ZBrush. To activate symmetry, you just press down X on your keyboard. If you're looking at your sphere from the wrong angle, turn it to the front so that you can see both sides of the cursor. By seeing both sides of the cursor, you can make know for sure that you are with symmetry on and everything's looking good. Throughout the process, make sure to not hit the X button unless you want to turn off symmetry. And check pretty often to see if symmetry is still on. I'm going to start by using the move brush to create an overall shape design for our little alien's head. So V for the brush palette, MV for move. I'm going to make my brush bigger with the draw size. And I'm going to start by giving kind of like a humanoid shaped head <laughs> and kind of shaping the skull. So I'm just pulling down the front where the kind of the jaw is going to be right here. And then I'm pulling the back a little bit where the cranium is being, that being the part where it holds the brain. We're going to keep this really humanoid. We're going to squish down the sides. And by the way, if you keep your brush really small, you're going to get like lumpy, irregular results. Like try to make your brush really nice and, and big for this process. Just kind of squish it down, get that more humanoid shape. And look at that. We already have kind of a, a very slight block out for a skull shape. Next, a good move would be to probably start digging in some landmarks. I use landmarks to kind of guide myself throughout the sculpting process. I use them to measure and compare. So I'm going to take the clay brush, BCL. I'm going to make that smaller, maybe not make the focal shift as aggressive. It's still like that because of the earlier demo. And then I'm going to press Alt and looks like it has RGB mode on right now, and some of your brushes might have RGB mode on by default. If that is ever the case, and you just want the brush to um, sculpt but not have color, just press down spacebar to get the options, and you'll see all of the options here. Z add, Z sub, and then turn off RGB. RGB will make it paint. Now we can just sculpt. So let's go ahead and kind of dig in some eyeball or eye sockets right there. Smooth the edges maybe a little bit because it's looking a little harsh already. We don't want it to be too harsh, right? Maybe a little bit of a nose bridge here. And here's an important tip when sculpting in ZBrush. Always be rotating around your model because that is just the nature of 3D modeling, right? You want to see all the changes you're making from multiple angles because something that looks great from the front might look absolutely horrific from the side. I'm just kind of digging in some eye holes, maybe making my brush a little bigger and then put in some cheekbones. I would encourage you to be creative with this design. Just let the alien that's in your heart come out on this one. I'm going to kind of smooth everything out. We still want it to be very clean in this phase. If everything's looking lumpy, take a step back and try to smooth. OK, we don't want it to look um, too, too muddy right now. We just want it to look pretty clean. We're only doing the, the cranium skull area. We're going to add in a neck as a separate tool. And then we'll discuss a little bit of that in a little bit. So maybe I'm going to do a tiny little bump for the nose here. And then 
I'm going to use my Damien standard B for brush panel, panel DS for Damien standard, and maybe add in a little mouth. Perhaps I can even add in the little nose already. And we're just kind of sketching in a little bit of what we want. So I'm using the move brush to kind of bring that out. So maybe I'll push in the cheeks here from the side view. That's always be rotating like that. Maybe, maybe I'll give it a little smile. It's a friendly tutorial after all. In. And a lot of this is just adjustments and design, but we're just using the few basic brushes that we talked about. I'm not going to use paint for a while, so we'll just be using three for now. Like that. Okay, so we've got something that would be mostly recognizable as a humanoid, I'd say. And the process is iterative. So little by little, we'll put something down and iterate on it until we like it. Next, let's discuss subtools. Like I mentioned earlier, a tool is basically a 3D model. That's how we call them in ZBrush. And a subtool is basically a sub 3D model that all together create the final tool. If you open up the subtool option underneath tool, on the right panel, you'll notice that there is a little bit of a list going on and some options for subtools. Right now we have our little head in here and it's our first subtool. We only have one, so we can't see too many. And let's go ahead and rename that to keep everything organized. So I'm going to call it head. Okay, right clicking this rename button right here. Then what I can do is append a new uh, subtool in order to add another subtool. Click that and we got a bunch of primitives to choose from. It, if you also have multiple tools open, which is something that you might do later on, you can also append those in. So append, and then I'm gonna choose a cylinder. <laughs> and there it is. Our cylinder is already in the scene. It's red because that's the color we have selected. And just select white to make that go away. Then we can select a cylinder by clicking on it in the subtool palette. Let's go ahead and rename this to neck. Then we're going to move the cylinder into a neck position. To move, scale, and rotate things in ZBrush, you might want to use the gizmo. To activate the gizmo, press W on your keyboard, and it brings up this very specific gizmo that I think only really happens in ZBrush. First, we have the arrows, which will move. Then we have the cubes, which will scale. So they will all move, scale, or rotate in the specific axis. If you use the yellow cube in the center, it will actually scale equally on all sides. Then we have the circles for rotation. Let's go ahead and move this down. Rotate it this way. Move it up. Maybe make it smaller, right? It's kind of a big neck. Make a skinny alien neck. And just attach it around there. Make sure symmetry is on, okay? Because symmetry is actually activated on a per subtool basis. So even though you have symmetry on in the head, you might not have symmetry on in the neck. So make sure you check. And then I'm gonna make it a little longer because you know skinny alien necks are nice when they're long. And then we can grab their move brush and start kind of shaping it up as we necessary. I'm just gonna add a little curve to it. And then later we can add a subtool for the shoulders. We're just gonna make a little bust. And this is how you're going to do your subtools. This is how you add them in. Let's go ahead and add in some eyeballs, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Append and Sphere 3D. Select it, rename Eyeballs, like that. And then W to get the gizmo. And we don't need symmetry for this one because if we do this with symmetry, we might actually end up messing up the eyeball. So let's just put it in one side. So scale it down and then move it into position. We're going to do big eyes because, you know, Indians are cooler with big eyes, if you ask me. Like that. 
there's one eyeball. You might be asking yourself, how do I get this eyeball on the other side? Well, I'm going to show you now. What we're going to do is close the subtool panel and go to the geometry panel right underneath it. And then we're going to go to modify topology, mirror and weld. You don't need to know all the stuff, just mirror and weld it. And now it's perfectly mirrored to the other side. If you move it now, you'll notice that it's doing it without symmetry. Press X to get symmetry. And now as you move, it will do it symmetrically. Let's add the shoulders to finish off our bust. So I'm going to append a sphere. Grab that, rename it shoulders. Move it down. Move it kind of to the end of the neck there. Maybe make it wider a little bit and maybe thinner front to back. And of course, we want to kind of move it around. Notice the symmetry is off. So press X to turn it on. And then we can just kind of shape this a little bit. Now all of our subtools are in. We can switch between them and kind of give all of them a little bit of love. The shortcuts for switching between subtools is Alt and click on the subtool you want to go to. But sometimes you have to make your brush a little smaller for that to work. The subtool that has the brighter color is the one that's selected. Now that we have all of these little shapes for our alien, let's combine them, except for the eyes, of course, we want the eyeballs to be separate. Let's combine them and dynamesh them to make them all into one mesh that we can easily flesh out. So first thing we're going to do is I'm going to select the top one and I'm going to go to merge, merge down this is my favorite way to merge. Just say always oh, okay. And now you'll notice that the subtool contains both the skull and the neck. We're not going to merge down into the eyes. So what we're going to do is we're going to move this tool down by using this kind of L-shaped <laughs> down arrow here. And then we're going to merge down again. So now we have the eyeballs on their separate subtool and the rest of the body on its own subtool. Let's Dynamesh. I'm going to kind of zoom in a little bit for you to see. And I'm going to turn on the polyframe, which is ZBrush's way of showing you the wireframe of your model. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to close the subtool panel and open geometry, Dynamesh, and we're going to hit the Dynamesh button. And automatically, it will create, to the best of its ability, equally sized squares and triangles that merge the objects together and give you way more flexibility when sculpting. However, and this is more of a art technique thing, I think this particular 128 is a little high for my current, the current state of my alien, because now I can get a lot more detail in, but that's not how I like to work. I like to work in a low resolution first so that I don't get more detail in so I can work on the big forms without worrying about like making little little details. So I'm going to undo that. You don't have to turn polyframe on. I'm just doing that to showcase this. And I'm going to turn the resolution down maybe to 56. And that's more like it. Okay. Now you can sculpt throughout the whole character evenly without worrying about anything. Let's go ahead and clean up the transition points. I'm going to use a little bit of clay and a little bit of smoothing. And then we're ready to flesh it out some more. I'm going to use those three brushes to flesh out this alien as much as I possibly can while still in this exact Dynamesh resolution. Once I feel like I can no longer squeeze any more detail out, I will allow myself to increase the resolution in Dynamesh again. You might be asking yourself, why have I chosen an alien for this project and not something more fundamental like the human head? Well, I always like using things like aliens or little demon creatures for our my introduction to ZBrush tutorials because they are very forgiving. Have you ever heard about the Uncanny Valley? Well, I always say that the best way to avoid the Uncanny Valley as a beginner is to avoid it altogether by just skipping ahead and doing something that is very flexible. We don't know what aliens look like or if they even exist. Therefore, it's a great subject for our sculpture. I find that beginners can be easily overwhelmed during this process and adding something that is highly technical to sculpt on top of learning all the commands and navigation is just too much. I really hope that you take this opportunity, if you're following along with this tutorial, to be creative and create your own alien and 
please tag me in it if you post it on social media at Anna Carolina underscore arts. Now that I feel I can no longer squeeze out any more shape or detail out of this Dynamesh resolution, I'm going to go back to geometry and back to Dynamesh, crank the resolution up a little. I like to do this incrementally, so you're not going to go crazy with it. Maybe 88 is fine. Then I'm going to click and drag on the background of my canvas to reset the Dynamesh and it will recalculate. And you see how we kind of have more, more squares now? Let's check. It looks like some areas need a little bit of help, but with a little smoothing, we can kind of get rid of a lot of those jaggedy edges. Like that. And then we can keep going and do the same process again. When sculpting, make sure to look at it from multiple angles. Just working at it from one or two angles or staying in one angle for too long is a very common habit that beginners have that leaves a certain lack of quality to the sculpt that some people can certainly notice, myself included. I really hope you've learned a lot so far. If you want to learn even more about modeling, check out Cinema 4D Basecamp, which will teach you everything you need to know to create your own awesome 3D things. Let's get back into it. So, we got this weird leafy alien that I created. Um, about halfway through, I started getting like fairy vibes and then uh, mantis vibes. So I'm kind of mixing the three. Once you feel like your sketch has progressed enough and you want to start detailing, you can be at a high resolution, so I'm at 416, and you got to make sure that even if you're not using Dynamesh, which, you know, you should explore later, um, you're at a high resolution when you're detailing. Let's go ahead and go to my clay buildup brush, and let's explore alphas and different kinds of strokes. So, first of all, alphas are just going to control the shape with which the brush is applied. So, if I maybe go in the back of my little guy here, and I apply the alpha right now, it says alpha off, so it's just kind of a default circle. But if I go ahead and choose, for example, alpha six, which is a star, you'll notice that the brush is applied in the shape of a star. By the way, you can draw any alpha you want in like Photoshop and then import it in as a PNG or Photoshop file, and then that will control the brush as well. That white areas are what's going to show and black areas are what's not going to show. You also have your stroke types. So right now we have stroke dot as the default for this brush, which is basically going to just drag little dots along a line along the stroke of your brush. But we got a few other options as well. For example, drag rectangle is going to let you drag in a single instance of that alpha, rotate it and scale it depending on how you drag your mouse. That is super useful for detailing and also painting. You can use it like a stamp. Then we also have spray and which will spray it around. Let's go ahead and use the spray version with maybe a more dotted alpha, like alpha 08, like this, to create some texture in our model. However, it looks a little higher intensity, so I'm going to turn down the intensity to like maybe 18, oh, even lower, 6. And let's go ahead and add some texture to some areas. Make sure symmetry is on. And then just drag that on. You can use any alpha you want. I'm just going to do this in the more flat areas that I didn't quite flesh out as much as the others. Let's smooth out some of these squares here. The bigger you make your brush, the bigger the alphas will be. Like this. It's really going to pepper some areas with this. Maybe smooth it a little bit if it gets too grainy. And then maybe a even lower resolution and smaller version around the face, just to add a little bit of, of skin texture. Flesh it out a little bit. Maybe the neck too, a little. Bit of that. And then we can get started with the painting. paints we're going to use the same brush as before the paint brush so bpa and i like to start the painting by putting down kind of a a nice little base color i'm going to choose a yellowy green for mine 
But feel free to choose whatever color you enjoy. And then I'm going to just paint it in. If you don't want to manually fill the whole thing, of course you can use color fill object to kind of paint bucket the whole creature like that. Then I'm going to choose some kind of lighter versions of a, a yellow color just for the face area, maybe a little bit more saturated. And then I'm just going to paint. If you want to add a little bit of variation in your color and not make it so flat like this, feel free to switch this to spray and put on an alpha as well. And that will create an even more kind of natural look as you paint your alien. For this alien, I went for a pretty generic design, I might say, at first, but eventually I started noticing some sort of more leafy, kind of like fairy look to it, naturally, organically, I didn't plan this out. And then I, I associated that with the praying mantis, specifically the orchid mantis, one of my favorite insects of all time. If you haven't seen it, I recommend Googling it is beautiful. So that is why for a portion of this tutorial, I have painted it pink and white and green after the orchid mantis. Of course, at the end, you'll see that I actually changed my mind. So let's talk about saving our little first sketch in ZBrush. There are two options that I use to save. The first is to go to the tool palette and save as, and this will save out the the tool that you can load up using load tool right here, and it will just open up in your tools palette. It's a very light file that doesn't contain your undo history. Or you can go to file and save as, and that will save your entire project with all of your settings, undo history, and all of that. It's up to you which one you pick, but I do recommend saving. Furthermore, ZBrush has a cool automated saving system called Quick Save right up here. I recommend clicking this a few times as you go through your project just to make sure you don't lose any progress. If you ever, you know, your computer crashes or something like that, just press down uh, the comma for the light box and go to the Quick Save tab. And here you'll be able to find, you can see like I have a lot of them. Uh, you can find the Quick Saves backups that you, that you might have. Uh, by default, I think it's around every 20 minutes or so that it quick saves on its own. So even if your computer crashes, you still have a backup from 20 minutes ago, which is perfect. Getting your 3D model out of ZBrush and into Cinema 4D is pretty easy. All you have to do is use the GoZ plugin. I'm going to go right up here in the tool panel and I'm going to go to GoZ. I'm going to say all because I want the eyes and the face to be exported together. I'm going to hit all, continue, and then it should automatically open Cinema 4D. And at first you won't really see anything, okay? What you're going to do is going to go to extensions, go ZBrush, go Z Importer, and there we have it. We have our beautiful model. But you might notice that we don't have any color. The problem is, is that we didn't really export a texture map. We don't even have UVs set up. So how do we turn the vertex color, the poly paints, into color in here? Well, first I'm going to select my model and I'm going to preview the vertex color by clicking on these four dots here, vertex color tag, right there. But you can only really preview it for now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click the material that was automatically created for my for my model, or I can just right click and create a new material. And then I go to color, texture, I'm going to click down this uh, little down arrow, effects, and then find your vertex map. Okay, then we're going to click vertex map, and then we're going to simply drag the four dots straight in here. And there we have it. Same thing for the eye. Let's go ahead and open up the eye shader, down arrow, effects, vertex map drag that right into oh i need to click first like there and there we have it now you can do whatever you want to do with it in here light it render it it's up to you thank you so much for watching this tutorial make sure to like this video and subscribe to the school of motion channel here on youtube you can also go to schoolofmotion.com to check out their online curriculum reach out to the school of motion team if you have any questions or want to find out more